Now, I am going to, to move on to uh, our panel presentation. And so, I would like to introduce the panelists, and I will start with uh, the, the far, uh, your far right, um, and uh, that, that is uh, Dr. Manish Pandey. Dr. Manish Pandey, he is from the Economics Department here at the University of Winnipeg. He is an associate professor here. He completed his undergraduate and graduate work at the Delhi School of Economics and finished his PhD at the University of Western Ontario in economics. Um, his areas of study include labor productivity, globalization, and looking at the outcomes of immigrants to Canada through pr the provincial nominee program. So Dr. Manish Pandey. Uh, also, uh, he has published in many uh, journals, including the Journal of Development Studies and Canadian Public Policy, and he's on the board of the India Centre. Secondly, next to um, Manish, is uh, Professor Darshani Kumara Gamaji. She is an associate professor with the Department of Environmental Studies and Sciences here at the University of Winnipeg. She has her PhD in soil sciences uh, from the University of Manitoba. She is from Sri Lanka originally, where she was a professional, sorry, a professor in so soil science there. And she has done research in a variety of areas, including looking at improving soil fertility management to enhance crop production, as well as looking at the role of NGOs and farmers organizations in Canada in terms of enhancing farm production. Um, and so next to uh, her is Dr. Derek Johnson. He is an associate professor from the University of Manitoba's anthropology department. Dr. Johnson has his PhD from the Rural Studies Department at the University of Guelph, the same program that Dr. Patel studied in. Uh, Dr. Johnson's areas include international development and natural resource uh, governance, and his particular focus is on, is on small-scale fisheries. He has a geographic focus on South Asia and is a co-principal investigator in the same project that Dr. Patel is the lead on. Uh, Dr. Johnson recently published a chapter in a book on fisheries uh, governance, which it looks very interesting. So what I've asked the respondents to do is to take three to five minutes, pick up on one or two issues, and pose a question to Dr. Patel. So I'll ask the respondents to, to share their comments and questions uh, sequentially. And, and then if uh, we'll, we'll go to Dr. Patel to respond to, to them, and then we may have some time for some, some back and forth with them. Now, one of the purposes of this respondent, this panel process, is to get you all to start thinking about questions that you might have, comments that you have, interactions that you want to have with both Dr. Patel and the respondent. So please, as, as they're talking and sharing, if you can think of uh, questions and comments, and then we're going to ask you to come down and, and ask your question down at one of these mics here. So, Dr. Pandey. Thank you, Jerry, uh, for organizing this and uh, inviting me to be a panelist. And uh, thanks to Dr. Patel, very, very informative talk. Not many jokes, though, became very serious, but <laughs> I was hoping there would be can. more fun. But I mean, it's not, uh, it, it is a very difficult topic to think about and, and, uh, and discuss. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, think, I'll, uh, I was thinking uh, while you were talking about uh, the issues that are being addressed in the economics discipline on, on uh, agriculture, in, in, uh, the big picture questions. And one of the big picture questions has been, and this is something that I've been interested in my research as, as well, has been uh, India seems to be an outlier in one other thing. And the other thing is there are too many people dependent on agriculture. And that, uh, uh, we uh, we were uh, we are doing this comparison with Korea starting in the 1950s and India right now, and the way the tra structural transformation has happened and uh, labor has moved out of agriculture into other sectors and so on, that has not happened in India. I mean. What has happened is service sector productivity is very high, but it is not employing people. Manufacturing is not employing that many people. So there, there, there is this huge dependency on agriculture. Uh, part of the reason that a few economists have started studying in, in the context of India in, in particular is the lack of land reforms. And what you talked about a little bit, the small farm sizes and so on, and what uh, not that we have any suggestions of what can be done, but what it's more in the uh, 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 right now it's in basically the realm of trying to understand what the problems are. 
and uh, uh, and that seems to be a big so there is a huge misallocation of labor that's that's essentially the central theme that is there uh, the other thing that I was thinking about is uh, towards the end you talked about this is uh, and uh, and this is what my reaction to the National Food Security Act was we don't need something that big we need decentralized solutions we need incremental steps and usually these incremental steps do much better than trying to handle a problem which is this complex with giving out subsidies and and uh, the, the, this criticism has been posed by a lot of people and the, the, this has been talked about a lot and one of the things that uh, that caught my eye on the national food security act was why are we piling on a, on a system of public uh, a public distribution system that is so broke and does not work it's essentially you instead of addressing and trying to fix the problems and making it more efficient the distribution system you're essentially increasing the burden on that system which is not really going to go anywhere so so in that sense uh, uh, yeah i mean I, i'm not a big fan of the national food security act and and uh, i i'm more on the uh, on the critique side of it uh, with regards to the green revolution, and, and this was the interesting thing, that the interesting theme that uh, I think uh, could be the punchline for for your talk is that while India attained self uh, self sustenance in food green production, it's the wrong kind of grain, right? And and what we've lost is the nutritional content in these grains, and I think that is a theme that. The, that come uh, to me that came out of the talk, and that is what my big takeaway from this is: that while we did this, we did the, we did it, and our focus was essentially not on nutrition, but it was essentially on on the food grain itself. And we didn't think about which grains to promote, and we in that process made it more uh, uh, essentially focused on grains that were more tasty or easy. I'm not really sure which way it goes maybe rice and wheat are more tastier or easier to market and eat than millet which i think is true i mean i've had millet and it's more difficult to digest than than wheat so but uh, well, but, but but i don't uh, uh, maybe you can shed some light on why these you know, why wheat and rice became the uh, grains of choice and uh, i i'll leave it at that thanks okay darcy Thank you, Jerry. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be the pa to be a panelist uh, today. Uh, first, I would like to congratulate Quirit. Uh, it was a very entertaining presentation, and also to congratulate him on undertaking uh, or leading this uh, important project uh, on improving uh, or, or promoting millet in uh, Southeast uh, or South Asia, which I'm pretty sure would have a significant impact uh, in uh, improving food security in that region. Um, now, one thing, uh, uh, I'll be mostly talking uh, 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 on the Sri Lankan context because I have lived in Sri Lanka for over 40 years. That gives my age away. Uh, but uh, during, during that period, something I have noticed is that uh, recently, uh, finger millet is becoming more popular. People are eating more uh, uh, finger millet because they uh, are aware of the nutritive value, they are aware of the medicinal value too. Uh, it's very popular among diabetic patients, uh, as uh, Kirit mentioned in India, it is the same. Uh, at the same time, uh, it, it is well known for another reason, and I don't know whether Kirit, whether you knew about this. The president of Sri Lanka always wears a shawl, uh, which is earthy brown in color, to represent finger millet uh, farmers. Mm -hmm. And he started uh, uh, wearing that uh, after his uncle. And his uncle uh, was wearing it since 1930s. He was a state councillor, and, and he was wearing it uh, to, again, represent finger millet growers in his region. So it was popular in 1930s. Maybe the popularity went down with the Green Revolution because then the focus was, like, like Manish said, rice and wheat, the quantity over quality. And, uh, but since 1990s, I was, in, I was in Sri Lanka until 2005, but I know the finger millet, we get it in different processed forms, finger millet noodles and finger millet flour. And 
it became popular. But even then, what I see is the decreasing uh, production. Even though it is becoming popular, the extent of area under finger millet is going down. In 1970s, it was about 20,000 hectares in Sri Lanka under finger millet, but now it is down to about 3,000 hectares. So my question to uh, Kirit is uh, why, when, the, when, it, when a crop, uh, uh, a product is becoming popular, why is the extent of cultivation going down? Is it the same in India or is it something specific to Sri Lanka? And if so, how could we, how could we encourage farmers to, to uh, because they are moving away from finger millet. They are growing more rice, uh, uh, other crops, uh, but not finger millet. Uh, so that is my question, uh, what, what, uh, what are the reasons and uh, uh, what are the challenges uh, that we have uh, in trying to promote uh, finger millet production? Thank you. Derek. I'll just echo the, uh, the thanks of the other speakers uh, for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I have the, um, so I guess, the advantage and disadvantage of being involved in the same project as uh, Dr. Patel. So I have, I have a lot of insider knowledge. Um, and I, I have an awareness of how much um, Kirit was able to convey, but also how much more is there. There's, there's such a rich depth in what we did and what we attempted to do that, um, that, that Kirit just didn't have the time to convey. So what I'd like to just try to tease out from Kirit is a couple of dimensions that I think he underplayed a bit. Um, and, and maybe point to some of the broader lessons, perhaps, from the project for, for the study of international development um, that, are, that are particularly useful for, for this context. Uh, so the, the first point that I wanted to talk about, and I'm glad that uh, Dinesh Mogaria is here. He's a postdoc on the project. He's, uh, he's working on the, really the economic dimension of small millets um, in, and, and the policy dimension as well. But uh, you know, I, I was talking with him yesterday, and one of the points that came out of that conversation was um, the power of the price for millets, and, and how price for millets has changed really significantly. In, in other words, the price of small millets has gone up very significantly, significantly in the last few years. And um, this has created real dilemma, kind of paradox, for our project. Because on, on the one hand, that's a good thing. That, that will raise farmer incomes, and it, it may well lead to a reversal of the decline in area of millet's cultivation. But the paradox is that it also is probably going to trigger a much greater outflow of small millets from the areas where they're grown. And so on the one hand, we're dealing with part of our project objectives, but we're sort of countering one of the other ones. Um, and I have a, a master's student who is working on millet market chains in one area, one of our project sites, and she's finding this. She's finding that the, the little millets are now, long, are now a marketable, they're, they've become commodified. And they're, now people's preferences are shifting, and they're, 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 they're moving to, to selling those on the market as opposed to consuming them locally. Um, and there's a whole complex set of factors around that, uh, but I'd like, I'd like you to, to, to reflect to us a little bit um, on some of those those paradoxes, and and then so that leads to an, another point, and that's that's the point, the broader point about development and development interventions. We you know we had a very limited time frame, a, a time frame of three and a half years, in uh, a very significant transition, a very significant set of transitions that are taking place. One of which is this market transition. You know what? What can a project, even a well-funded project of this size, hope to accomplish in such a short time frame with such enormous um, transitions taking place that that are really out of our control? And so I'd like you to, if you can, point to maybe some of the 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 points of intervention that that even a modest project like this can make um, to to maybe mobilize um, positive change. Um, then the, the, the last point I wanted to touch on was that, that the, the, real, the reason I believe that IDRC funded this project was for its ambition. It, it, was, it was very broad in terms of content, but it was also ambitious in terms of making connections between social scientists and natural scientists and between um, 
farmers and academics. And it did that in a way, in a well-articulated way that many other projects in this, um, in this, this program didn't do. So, but in my experience in, in participating in this project, I felt like over this short three and a half year time period, we did a lot of dancing around each other in terms of the different uh, disciplinary perspectives that were represented. And, and in terms of the, the relationship between the academics and the practitioners um, in the project. And that I don't know that that dance was ever really fully sort of consummated, maybe to push the metaphor too far. But um, <laughs> it, it, it felt like we were constantly struggling in the project to communicate properly. And, um, and so from a social science point of view, I, I found myself frustrated. You know, our big idea in the project was one you didn't mention, the idea of, of ecology of practice. And that was the sense that for each particular area where you want to undertake millet interventions, you need to consider sort of the rich, textured, contextual factors that shape how that, that, that shape the, the factors to which our interventions have to respond. I felt like even in our last meeting last month, the, the, the natural scientists still didn't get it. And they, they st you know, maybe that's probably a communications failure on our part. But, and, and I'm sure I, there, there are lots of things like participatory varietal selection that I don't really get. <laughs> but um, you know, it's, another, it's another problem about short project time frames. Um, but but you know, how, at, at the level of a fairly intimate group that work closely together, uh, we're still not able to, to overcome very significant boundaries to achieve um, to achieve a really, let's say, unified kind of intervention. So what hope is there at the scale of, of South Asia where you've got natural scientists siloed off in their own specific colleges and universities and research stations, and then you've got a small number of social scientists maybe siloed off somewhere else? And then add to that complexity to the need to sort of bring farmers in in participatory ways. Okay, so. There's lots more I'd love to say, but I'll leave it at that. Okay, well, just before I ask Kirit to respond, I'd just like to say that these are awesome uh, responses from our panel. Thank you all. Um, I wondered, though, if we could leave some time for Q&A at the end. So I don't know, Kirit, if you could maybe f pick, a, uh, pick a few of those, those questions and, and respond, and yeah. Thank you. I guess uh, the number of questions I have are probably, it seems you won't go home up to two, <laughs> 10 o'clock or something, so I won't dare to answer each. Uh, but <clears throat> Manish, I agree with uh, yeah, your point on allocation of labor, very complex process in India. And <clears throat> I was telling in my presentation too, that uh, rural urban migration, again, it's a function of that labor <clears throat> opportunity. And uh, no one has idea that, we, <clears throat> sorry, where it is going and how it is going. And so I don't think I have a, <clears throat> I mean, an answer to that question. But from the development practitioner perspective, what I see, I mean, a problem is that still the most of the NGOs, they consider their job is to keep rural people in agrarian landscape. They, their development vision is very agrarian. And if let's say in a village you have a two NGOs working in the village, and at the end of the five years project, even if with a modest expectation than what Derek has, uh, <clears throat> the people leave from the village and go for a work to the nearby town, the NGOs consider it is a failure of their project. Nowhere people would be funded. NGOs never, I mean, facilitate that process, which I really found it very dubious. When I was living in the village, I mean, the tribals wanted to go and work in the cities. No, I mean, there were a number of NGOs flooded in the landscape. And they thought that their job is to change the variety. And, and where the farmers, these poor tribal had no interest. I mean, not, not having interest just because they do not have interest because there are the circumstances in which they are, it is not viable. Why not these NGOs, these NGOs, if they are really committed for the betterment of the people, 
I would have said that let's work with these people, help them to find a job in the city. I mean, they were living on the street, on the roads. They had no, I mean, most of the time when I went to the city, they were trying to send with me the millets and corn because these people were living in the city, no, had no access to those grains where they, they were eating. They were also looking for sending the money and uh, sending the messages. So I was all the time, I, was, I mean, that's how my relationship with the, was built. And I was actually filling that void, which none of the NGOs thought to fill that void because their vision was so agrarian that these people have to be st have to stay on the farm. We are, I mean, considering an agricultural, I mean, a nation or whatever. We are emotionally and whatever the, attached so much. I mean, we need to look at it more, more critically. And then again, I mean, the, the issue of this uh, rural employment scheme on which the current government thinks to get into power again, I mean, it has made it even a more complicated, I mean, the issue. So I don't know, I have answer, and same is the land reform. Nothing has, I mean, a very complex issue. The land prices in the last 10 years or 12 years after I left India, it had changed I mean, it has increased 30 times in my village. The whatever the piece of the land when I left in the year 2000, it is 30 times more than what it was before 12 years. So the, for them, it is an opportunity to sell and go. And the other side, the state and everyone is trying to work in the other way. And I don't know. I mean, the, the, again, the looking at the context is very important. It's a very important issue which needs to be researched. Uh, <clears throat> In terms of a food security bill, my, I mean, again, the, the disappointment with the, uh, I mean, with the whole process, I mean, I praise a lot about the democracy in India. But my frustration with this bill, uh, if you remember, the bill was passed as a presidential uh, ordinance. And I don't remember in my memory in the last 20 years since I know the politics, that a single bill had been passed as an ordinance. An ordinance means that, a, like an American presidential veto, there was no discussion in the parliament whatsoever. There were so many, I mean, innovation done by, I mean, the provinces in the public distribution system, but nothing was taken into account. So the, again, the, I mean, in one sense, it had a robust democracy, I mean, in, the, in, the, in terms of a running the election, but in term, the parliament cannot talk something more constructively. And that's something which we need to learn, I mean, as a nation. And that's where we lost the opportunity, I guess, on the food security bill as well. The Darshi's question, again, I mean, uh, all my visits, I got intrigued with this question, that in Sri Lanka, it's totally different than India. The area, the food, uh, the, uh, sorry, the finger millet is not grown, but in consumption, I see everywhere. I find the finger millet based food in restaurant, everywhere on, where on the roads, everywhere, I mean, in the household level. So it was amazing that the, still the millets were in the consumption, but not on the, on the agricultural landscape. And the current government was so keen, I mean, they were to reduce the import bill. But I think it also reflects the, I mean, the economic status and, and also the knowledge about about the, I mean, the, these millets. Uh, Sri Lanka is, a, in my view, it's a totally different than the rest of South Asia. If they had not undergone that, I mean, the ethnic-based political conflict, it would have been a part of a developed country. You have, I mean, a very good uh, social system of education. The public distribution for food was put there. I think in the history, they were the pioneer. In 1940, Sri Lanka, in, I mean, introduced. So, I mean, I, I don't have an answer. I'm still struggling to find out that why this, I mean, anomaly exists, which is not the part of, you know, I mean, not in the case of India. The Derek's uh, question about the paradox, uh, yeah, we spend often, I guess, the hours and hours. And during this talk, I was reflecting on, on the issue of a milk. Uh, I come from a Gujarat, and, and the milk it was promoted in the last 30 years. And I looked at the data compared with the small millets. And milk is one of the most, I mean, the successful case where the, the consumption of milk, which, I mean, has increased uh, significantly in the country. And the whole chain which was put into place in milk is a, is a totally a different. It's a co-op is, I mean, very successful, world largest co-op system, I mean, uh, promoting the milk. And very different, the producers are still the small landless farmers. The milk is produced by, I mean, 50% of the milk contributor to the, those dairies are the landless people. So the production is very decentralized. 
But what Dr. Kurian did remarkably, which was different than the, the Green Revolution, I, I, I have been talking with you to do a comparative analysis of a Green Revolution and a White Revolution. The way White Revolution institutions were created was totally different. So the, the production remained decentralized in a small scale. The processing where it has invested, not in the production. And, and that has led to a different type of impact. But the paradox which you are uh, talking about the increase in the consumption in the cities, even in the milk data, I saw the milk consumption was more in the urban areas compared to the rural areas. So, and this is after 30 years, and I guess so now the rural area would probably catch up. You can't solve this problem overnight, in my view. I mean, three years is a dot, even. You can't even think of it. The interdisciplinarity, again, it's a whole history, long history we are trying to break with those scientists. The talking about the participatory breeding, bringing them to the farmer's field, which they have not done in their life, and they were successful plant breeder. Actually, our problem was that we picked up the most successful scientists, and the best scientists, they were so, I mean, a great believer in their own approaches. So they, they said that, oh, we do talk to farmers. What do they need to do this, right? So it's a big barrier. I mean, uh, but we are making a progress. I, I don't expect that it would change at the end of the project. I mean, it would be, it's a long, long process. And, uh, and so is the participatory development process too. There is another beautiful, I mean, excellent analysis of a participatory project written by David Moss, a uh, similar type of a project. And he did, uh, as an anthropologist, uh, he sat in the project for 10 years and he published a book. And the book was so critical about his colleagues from the plant sciences. So actually, they went to the, uh, the president of the university to stop the publication of the book. They did not agree with, with, the, with the analysis of anthropology. So it's a tough job, in my view. Yeah. So I guess we should give us some chance to the other questions, and we can come back. Yeah. OK, good. Thank you very much. Now, are there people with questions or comments? Yeah, come on down. Uh, we have microphones here. Um, please, if you have a question or comment, come on down. and. Uh, Share it. Yes, thank you. Hi. Hi. Yeah, um, well, basically, I wanted to touch on one of those things that you had mentioned earlier in your uh, lecture there. You had mentioned that one of the problems with processing the small millets was the, la the increase in labor for women in, in these villages. Now, I did a little bit of digging while I was up there, and I found that there's a few companies that offer small millet machines, processing machines. Now, I just wanted to get a clarification. Is, is the problem that they're not, it's the type of millet that's not being produced, or is it the power requirements that is just not available in these villages? Do you want me to report? Yeah, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Since it's a technical question, I mean, uh, we did look at the different types of technology available in the market. The biggest problem with the quality and nutrition, okay. the expectation of farmers, they never, I mean, they never consider the processed millet is the same millet what they eat at home. And we, we did the research on the market chain, and the, well, the city I was talking about they were called Nasik. They had an industrial processing unit. And our nutritionist also looked at the, I mean, the processed product. What we found, that the little millet, which is often marketed here, it is brushed 22 times. That little grain is brushed 22 times in order to remove that, that I mean, the layer. Okay. And whatever the good the grain had, actually that has, has lost. So the nutrition quality is the most important, which the, the existing technology has a problem. And the scale, the scale which farmers want to have it at a household level and at the community level. That's the, I mean, the cost is unaffordable for our farmers. Okay, so basically what the issue is then is it's a cost versus nutrition and also, as you mentioned, power consumption. Yes. So basically what, what's required is somebody to develop something that does a little bit less processing on the seeds and providing a po basically a powerless unit, something yes. that can be powered either by solar or whatever. All right. You have said well, yeah. Sounds like we've got a potential. And that's the challenge for a world food price, that's what I was saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sounds like we have a potential innovator here. Th yeah. Thanks for your question. Yes, please. <coughs> Hi. Now, um, I like your presentation. Um, the concept of uh, food security for the poor by the poor uh, is fabulous. I have just a couple of questions. Uh, the, it's like, India is a growing economy right now. 
So, and uh, agriculture, as far as data has been concerned, agriculture has been contributing about 21% of it. So, uh, but in, in the contrary, there has been increasing credits. That is, uh, according to data, it's 3.3% uh, has increased to 14.4%. There is decreasing uh, public investment from about 3.3% to 0.6 or something, or 1.2. Whereas there is increase in private investment, that's uh, 1.2 to something around uh, 3 to 4 percent. Because of this, uh, there, there is lots of debts increase in the farmers. So why is uh, India promoting food grains uh, for the economic growth? It, because well, whereas uh, the citizens of India, I mean the farmers, uh, are, su are suffering from debt, uh, I mean debt and uh, other, other problems, other social problems too. Mm. Whereas uh, even though uh, this growth, what does it mean after all? By because still this growth, uh, well, still after all this, uh, after all this thing, for food, uh, food grains and everything, there is still one uh, one third of the population is poor, absolute poor estimated according to estimation, and uh, more than half of the ch children are malnourished. So, my question is why why is still India promoting uh, policies and subsidies that promote wheat and rice and other kind of stuff and uh, stuff and still increase the credits, what's the reason? Okay, so particularly your, cons your, your question is focused on this debt issue and why is the government promoting yeah. uh, m micro loans and, and other forms of credit that's really creating greater debt for the small farmer? I don't know, uh, is there somebody who feels comfortable to answer that, that question? Maybe Manish? Or maybe you are the right person. <laughs> I, I don't I know the Indian the case. Best person to take that. <laughs> I, I don't know in India, Manesh. Do you? Can you speak uh, to that? Not that I have thought about that now. But uh, I mean, uh, see, the the problem is that uh, the political will is on the wrong side on this. I mean, what the whole policy, the way it is being framed, is just a, a, the the idea is that elections are coming and you want to subsidize there is no thinking in terms of what the issues are. So that, that debate has been absolutely lacking. And this comes back to Kirit's point that that is why this bill was never even debated, right? Because there are so many issues that are entangled in here. Rather than solving these issues, those issues that you're raising, the, the, the idea is that if we basically give food grades for cheaper, that gives us more. So that has been the mentality right now, right? Bigger problems. Who will address that? Where is the political will for that? I don't know. So, uh, so this is the concept that India presents that government for the people, by the people, has gone to a failure, as, as we see. So does it, this- it is, it is a government failure. <coughs> yeah, so does this concept too, food security for the poor, by the poor, by the poor could result into a failure just as the government has did? Because initiative has been created, uh, has been done. I mean, attempt is there, but or do you think that it will succeed in the in such an, uh, in a, such a high corrupt country where you can see corruption in a lower level? I mean, even at the mm -hmm. level of a compounder or something. So, do you think it will succeed? Okay, so so you're wondering about this issue of government corruption, and is that a factor yeah. that would prevent? I don't know if anyone feels comfortable to respond to to that. I mean, it's sort of getting off of the topic of the presentation. Um, did you want to say anything, Kirit, or? Maybe I would say that it has a both the extreme in the country. I mean, still it is running and it is working. I mean, right now, maybe I might have said too much about the other side, but there are positive stories too. And uh, the street food vendor study, which I mentioned, and probably if you had been to Chennai, I mean, last year, the, Chen the Tamil Nadu government started a uh, food shop called Idli Shops and, and are running very well. It's a very good, uh, example of a government's intervention. They basically, they are providing uh, ready-to-eat food at the subsidized cost and with excellent quality I haven't seen anywhere. So there are successful examples. I'm still not losing my hope. I mean, there is a possibility that it, I mean, it can change the things around, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And I think in light of the time, there's just a couple of things I'd like to do before uh, we wrap up. If I could just offer, and uh, I'll, I'll blame it on uh, Kirit, because he said, well, you should do some th synthesizing at the end. So if I could just offer a couple of synthesis comments about what we've done in these public lectures. And I wouldn't say that our six presenters had, you know, very, um, uh, that all the things that they said were in common. 
But I did notice a lot of common points that they raised. And if I could just maybe identify the commonality. Each of them had distinctives and, and were offering some really useful distinctive points. But there were some very interesting common themes. And one of the common themes I wanted to use Kirit's um, uh, statement he made as an example. He mentioned that he supported or he felt that the comment of the Indian president in 2012 about two key um, successes that India had made in the past 50 years being that it was a democratic country and that it, it had achieved food, um, increased food production significantly. Um, this is a comment that many of our Esau visiting distinguished profs had, have said that the system today is completely dysfunctional. Most of our speakers have said that there are elements of the food and farming systems today that work and that we shouldn't reject the, the complete system. So there were, there were different ways that, that they took that point, but, but it was a common point. So our speakers haven't called for radical, um, dramatically radical changes. They've, they've identified some, some strengths in the current system. However, there were two areas that I would say I saw some common critique. And one of them I would, I would identify as the, the issue of holistic. And, and I would say that every one of our speakers were looking for the food and farming systems to operate more holistically. And that is to say that rather than separating the food system, separating the farming system from whether it's the environment, the ecology, or whether it's the society or the community, that we need to integrate them more. We need to understand, well, they are integrated, and we need to recognize that integration. We need to be deliberate about it. We need to support it. And so I see that um, virtually all of our speakers have talked about the need for that greater integration and being deliberate about it. And then the, the final point that I wanted to make in terms of where I see a lot of common conversation is about control and equity. And, and I think that was seen in Dr. Patel's presentation as well as many other presentations, that it's not necessarily saying that um, large is always bad, corporations are always evil, big governments um, are always out to get the small player, uh, but it is to say that there is some tremendous um, uh, asymmetries in politics, in the economy, where we have very big players and then a lot of very small players, and this is causing some major problems and explains the prevalence and the continuation of poverty and malnutrition, et cetera. And so this issue of rebalancing seems to be a really key one. And some, you know, like Shirley Thompson talked about community economic development as a means to empower northern communities. And um, Eric Holtimenez talked about farmer to farmer exchanges. Um, as a way to, to rebalance um, these kinds of control issues. And related to control, I think, is equity. And, and all of our speakers have talked about the importance of equity. And it's fine to have a productive economic system, but if it doesn't also foster a level of equity, in the end, it's going to hurt, harm itself. So anyways, those are a few thoughts. I hope that you have some thoughts. Uh, you know, you've put some ideas together about these um, presentations. And um, just um, wanted to ask uh, two things. Uh, first of all, if you could take a moment to fill out the survey. And I understand that if you submit the survey with your name and email address, you'll be in a draw for a $60 McNally Robinson uh, gift card. So that's an added incentive. We're, we're commodifying here at Menno Simons College. <laughs> so um, that's one thing. And um, I also wanted to mention that um, just after we thank our panel and presenter, you're welcome to join us for refreshments, including samosas, that are a contribution by the India Center. Um, and so, uh, but before we go up and, and enjoy the samosas and refreshments, I'd just like you to, um, I'd like to ask you to uh, help me to thank Dr. Kirit Patel, our Esau visiting professor, and our respondents. Okay, so thank you very much, and please join us upstairs for refreshments.